Well, very good morning to you in the uh, Caribbean or the Americas. Uh, good afternoon if you're in Europe and the Middle East, and good evening to you if you're watching from the Asia Pacific region. Uh, welcome to today's Crossing Borders broadcast, the INC streaming service created to keep investment migration professionals uh, connected and informed. If you haven't seen one of these broadcasts before, don't worry, you can catch up through our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit like, share and subscribe for current updates. Remember, in today's session, you can ask questions using the widget at the bottom right hand uh, of your screen, where you will also find some useful handouts uh, from the IMC, IMC Education and Training, IMC Yearbook, and today's uh, sponsor, uh, Polaris Citizenship by Investment Group in St. Lucia. And to keep you engaged, as ever, uh, we'll have a little bit of polling. Uh, so to test this out, you should be seeing on your screen a little poll, and we just want to know where everybody is tuned in from today. So we'll get up to 85% response rate before we close the poll. All right, just share the results then. Uh, here we go. So, 50% of you from Europe and Africa, and then in joint second place, Asia Pacific and the Americas with 20%, and 10% of our audience is from the Middle East. Uh, so, a very warm welcome to you all today. It's interesting and, and good for us and our speakers to know. Uh, there's also a short video at the end of today's program about how you can get qualified through the certification in investment migration. So do stay with us. But back to today's broadcasts. Kangaroos and bananas, a question of the rule of law uh, in and due process in St. Lucia. So just going to hide this and close that and make sure that my speakers, my invited speakers uh, are with us uh, today. Uh, so I'm glad to welcome Jeffrey Dubelet, uh, who's the managing partner of Flossiak Fleming and Associates and the managing director of Polaris Citizenship and Investment Consultancy Services. Uh, in St. Lucia. Uh, Jeffrey has a master's degree in commercial and corporate law uh, and has over 20 years experience as a practicing attorney. Uh, a very good morning uh, to you, Jeffrey. Hi, morning, Bruno. Nice to be here and to be a part of it. It's, it's great to see you again, although we were just um, uh, saying we, we saw each other uh, in Brussels uh, last month for the investment uh, migration uh, forum. Um, and I'm uh, also joined by Keith Isaac, who's an attorney at law at the firm Flossack Fleming and Associates and is the general manager for Polaris uh, Citizenship in St. Lucia. Uh, Keith has a master's degree in law and is a certified investment migration professional through the IMC education and training uh, offering. Uh, he's also a five time former St. Lucia national youth parliamentarian uh, and a former junior minister for tourism in St. Lucia. Very good morning, uh, Keith, and welcome to Crossing Borders. Good morning, Bruno. So, gents, kangaroos and bananas. Well, as a bit of background for, for our audience, um, and I certainly like to know a little bit more about how you came, um, and how you penned uh, this, uh, this title. But look, the motives for obtaining citizenship uh, and the perceived benefits of citizenship by investment uh, often vary. Um, however, there is one thing that binds um, this motivation uh, together, and that is often the desire to obtain uh, and retain the citizenship 
uh, of a respected, legitimate democracy uh, which is governed by the rule of law. Uh, and that's something which is shared by uh, all migrants um, and economic migrants, uh, no matter which migration pathway uh, they choose. So the rule of law in principle, uh, which dates back to the 16th century Britain, uh, prescribes that all citizens must bear equal subordination to the law of the land. So that's a, a little bit of background, but we do want to focus uh, on the rule of law in the Caribbean and how St. Lucia uh, plays a, a role with that. And, and I want to go in straight with a question uh, to you, Jeffrey. Um, some commentators uh, in the space of in investment migration have had and aired concerns uh, about the legitimacy uh, of the Caribbean's uh, legal system. As an attorney working in that system, um, can you provide us some insights um, for our uh, viewers who you know, are coming from Asia Pacific, uh, the Americas, uh, but also Europe and the Middle East, uh, on the uh, Caribbean's judiciary, please. Yeah, well, th thanks a lot, Bruno, and, and, and thanks for having us. Um, it's really a pleasure to once again, you know, work alongside with the IMC, um, you know, particularly on a topic such as the one we're going to discuss this morning. You know, we see it as part of our duty to continue assisting, um, you know, people, stakeholders in the industry and just just potential investors about uh, you know, just educating people about, you know, what underpins, particularly in this case, um, you know, the concept of the rule of law. So to just backtrack for a minute, um, yeah. the, 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 the title came from, um, or it, it, it arose out of a very disparaging article and that, that we read one day on LinkedIn, it was a, I'll never forget it, it was a Saturday morning and I'm, I'm sort of scrolling through and bounced on this article um, where, 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 where this commentator, um, I, I, I dare say without spending any time to even, you know, scratch the surface to do any research on, on the jurisdiction. When I speak of the jurisdiction, I might speak particularly of St. Lucia, but there's a wider right. jurisdiction. Um, without doing any research at all to understand um, you know, the concept of, of our judicial system and its history and, and its present day composition and administration and management. Um, referred, to, referred to our courts as, as, um, as kangaroo courts and referred to our countries as banana republics. I mean, it was, it, it was the most far-fetched um, article that I'd read, read in, in a long time. But again, right. you know, it, it's irresponsible of people if they just want to do damage to you with no sense of accountability. And, and that's where it came up. So, you know, I came down to the office that day and, and spoke with Keith. Um, we sort of urgently met and, and figured, well, we would pen something out and, and put it out there. And obviously the best, the best people to put it out with what, what was with the IMC because of, you know, your, your mandate and to, to guide and assist and educate people. So, so that's where it came from. And, and we, feel, we felt very strongly about it. Um, and, 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 and particularly because, you know, the, the, the thing about it is that jurisdictions leverage their sovereignty to create a CBI or an RCBI program. And mm -hmm. so everything comes out of the law. So if, 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 you're, if you're from a jurisdiction or looking to invest in a jurisdiction um, without, you know, a good, strong um, subscription to the rule of law, then, then the program is not worth anything. Right. Any, you know, so, Jeffrey, if I can, how is that, how is your legal system truck, uh, structured uh, in St. Lucia? Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting to, to get a little bit of background. Um, so as, as, as most people would know, it, we were for, former British colonies. And so there was a transition between, if you like, being totally governed by by, by the UK um, to where we are today as independent states. So the first step was, was for what, what was what we call associated statehood, um, where an order was passed um, to grant and to create what is now our Supreme Court. Now, 
that court in present day is itinerant. So it serves um, a number of different territories, well, member states, which would be um, in, in the context of CBI, Dominica, Grenada, Antigua, St. Lucia, amongst others. And interestingly, some British overseas territories, Monstrat, Anguilla, and the British Virgin Islands. So, so the court actually travels through those through those territories and member states, sitting in those various jurisdictions um, to hear matters. And you have a two-tiered court, which the first the first tier would be in the high court, which would be resident in the jurisdiction, hearing you know civil civil and criminal matters on a daily basis. And then you would have the second tier, which is the Court of Appeal, which again sits at various um, scheduled dates and times during the course of the year to hear appeals from the High Court. Now, what, what is interesting, just like, and it's, it, it's based on the judicial system out of, uh, out of the UK, is that mm -hmm. at the Court of Appeal level, we have three sitting judges who would adjudicate on any matter. Um, so basically, um, you, you could have, just like in the UK, dissenting opinions, but at the end of the day, the majority opinion, um, you know, prevail. And, and that court, as I said, travels through the member states and territories mm -hmm. and, um, and dispenses justice uh, across those member states. So it, 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 it's a very strong underpinning with a very rich history coming out of the UK. And what is fascinating about it is that we a lot of our of our take, take for example our chief justices we've had two chief justices one who was the founding member of our firm Sir Vincent Flosak who sat as a privy councillor in the UK um, at the privy council and as you know the privy council is the final um, the final appellate court for for the British Commonwealth and also Sir Dennis Byron who 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 was our chief justice and sat on the UN um, criminal criminal tribunal for Rwanda. Mm -hmm, so we've had some amazing amazing jurists, um, not only in their own in their own right, but also what is notable for the purposes of the rule of law is to be recognised at those levels, holding the strong principles of justice and independence and objective and objectivity to be appointed to those international courts is nothing short of fascinating and is strong evidence and testimony of the integrity and credibility of our judicial system. So I know I've thrown a lot at you there, Bruno, but, mm -hmm. but you know, we're trying to bring it all together um, in a very short space of time to give credence to and, and, and getting people to understand, if you like, the strong sense of value of our judicial system. Yeah, I think there's, there's always definitely a, a, a lot of meat on the bone. Um, but I want to bring in a poll that we've put together, which I'm going to put on the screen now for our viewers, um, because we are talking about citizenship by investment um, as you know the principal business uh, of your firm, um, and as lawyers, you are licensed agents um, to handle applications uh, on behalf of third country nationals wishing to become naturalised uh, Saint Lucians. Um, I think here, what we want to know is really is to test is a couple of things is what do the audience know uh, about the legal systems in the Caribbean uh, and have they been listening a little bit for, for what you've been saying? So what we're asking is which of these statements is true about the legal systems um, of the Caribbean CBI uh, offering? So there is no right of appeal against a decision to strip somebody uh, of their citizenship. All five islands are under the jurisdiction of the same court, and a decision to grant or deny citizenship is made uh, by one person. So I give you, oh yeah, people are, are answering really quickly on this. <laughs> I have everyone's really voted, so Let's share those results. The 86% thought 
The answer was all five islands are under the jurisdiction of the same court. Keith, do you want to weigh in on this a little bit? Well, the majority were definitely correct. All five islands are part of the Eastern Caribbean and we all fall under the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, have the same court of appeal. And like Jeffrey said earlier, our final appellate court is the Privy Council. Mm -hmm. All right. What, so what benefits, if any, do you believe the Caribbean's legal system has for uh, its investment migration offering as, you know, in comparison to, say, um, uh, a European uh, CBI or a European RBI, which people then can convert into uh, a fully-fledged uh, citizenship? Um, what are the benefits, in your opinion? Thank you, Bruno. I think that our value proposition to our investors is really certainty and stability noting that we have an over 50 year old court and that the laws around citizenship by investment are quite well understood in the caribbean context quite well entrenched economic citizens or new citizens so to speak there can be a level of comfort in knowing that one you are governed and part of a legal system which has a lot of history which has good judicial precedent which is well followed which is unbiased noting that the court spans several islands so it's not very political at all it's a very independent court in many ways well entirely really. and the judges are all from different countries with different backgrounds and they all have issues from islands that they don't necessarily have a major connection to which i think is a good thing for the law in that you don't want biased judges. You don't want individuals who are political one way or another in regard to citizenship. Mm -hmm. What you want to know is that you will be treated as a citizen, as every citizen, and more importantly, that every citizen is treated fairly in the jurisdiction. And I think that the Caribbean region, particularly, I think we do that extremely well. And I think that there's a strong sense of law, order, and really justice, so to speak, in our region, which can make investors quite comfortable. And I think that's part of the reason that we're very, that the Caribbean region really is a, the most popular for citizenship by investment in the world. Right, and the proceedings, uh, what languages are used in, um, in your courts? and the frameworks how are the laws published so firstly the court everything happens in english if you don't speak english then you can't have a translator pres present but the proceedings are for the most part in english laws are this laws are first drafted by the attorney general's chambers and then these laws go to parliament there's two houses of parliament as you would have in the uk these laws are passed and then they're then published in the National Gazette for the entire citizenry to see. And you have access to these laws through the Houses of Parliament. Most law firms, we get electronic copies of all of the laws, so it's fairly accessible. And the wording of the laws also is quite important in that we try to make our laws, we try to write them in a way which people can understand for the most part. Obviously, you need lawyers but they're not inaccessible to the lay person which is important both for potential citizens and important to you if you're gonna need to go to court or to use our judicial system you want laws which can be easily interpreted and easily applied to your unique situation and i think that we do that very well in the caribbean Right. Yeah, and there's one other thing I would add to that. Um, to, well, two points really. The first point is that a lot of our laws are written against um, some of the British, uh, the British Commonwealth ter um, Commonwealth members. So, for example, you would have laws that are mirrored out of Australia. Um, you know that that that's one that jumps to mind. Um, 
in Canada, for example, some of our lots are written on templates coming out of Canada and obviously tailor made to our, our unique social and ec economic space. In addition to that, one of the most one, one of the most interesting things, just like in the UK, Bruno, is that all of our decisions of our courts are published online. So you could literally go onto Google, go onto the website, and download any any decision of the High Court and our Court of Appeal that is available for for reading. And 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 just ju just as I'm speaking as well, there's a third very important point. Most of most, if not all of our laws are interpreted in accordance with established principles of statutory interpretation as established by the UK courts. So for mm -hmm. example, I mean any lawyer listening on would know would know of um, Benyon's on statutory interpretation, which is um, you know the practitioner's text on interpreting um, legislation. And that is what we use in assisting in, in interpreting um, you know laws laws in St. Lucia. And that that's across that that's across all of the uh, member states and territories as well. So so again, you know, stepping back into the context that I spoke of earlier, you know, where did where did we come from as former ter colonies into associated statehood and now into independence? But it's still the underpinning of the British um, of, of of the British legal system with some of our own little peculiarities along the way. Okay, well, we've got some, uh, well, a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll ask one now, because uh, I think it's quite appropriate, really. Um, it comes from somebody in the Middle East, uh, and just remind our viewers, if you do have a question, please use the widget at the bottom right um, of, your, of your screen and type in your question, and we'll try and get to those as best we can. Um, all right, the question is in short, and I'll sort of interpret it a little bit. Um, if I do need a lawyer in St. Lucia, how do I find uh, a lawyer? How do I know he's good? How do I know he's regulated? Uh, how do I know he's not corrupt? How do I know uh, he is a professional in what he does? It's a good question, you know, because like any um, profession, you kind of can get a, a mixed bag uh, of people, uh, but generally, if there's a regulated profession, you're kind of more or less assured um, to get somebody who's you know, of a good quality, but also somebody who's supervised. Uh, but of course, it's not my question. It's uh, somebody from the Middle East. Um, perhaps you know, both of you gentlemen could, could address that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a fantastic question and I'll tell you why. I had, I've had a few experiences in my practice where I've had to refer St. Lucian clients to foreign lawyers and you know ensuring that 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 you get a lawyer that meets meets those those requirements is definitely a challenge you want to make sure that you're making a good referral and somebody's in good hands um the first thing is you obviously you need to ensure that they that they have a valid practice and certificate so whichever lawyer you shortlist you would want to ensure that you get that secondly um one of the basic ways of doing it just a just a normal google search um if if you go to the court's website you could find out the lawyers and the law firms. You could see, you know, what what is being published um, by their law firms in 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 the courts. Thirdly, one of the one of the things we do is um, is go through the websites and see what sort of international global networks that they are mem that they are members of, because you know when 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 you because we're part of two networks and for you to get um, exclusive membership of these networks, you have to go through rigorous accreditation. And, and vetting and continuous audits. So, so, so just the normal tried and tested ways of of ensuring that you're selecting somebody, you know, that can give you a good service at international standards. But at the very basic level, you know, you want to ensure that they have a valid practice in certificate. All right. And does does the uh, is there like a chamber of um, of commerce for attorneys or a, a, a law society? How is that structured? Yeah, we we, we have a, a bar association, so the Saint Lucia Bar right. Association, which is which again, um, and 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 all of our attorneys are regulated by the Legal Profession Act. So um, so 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 we have a very robust legislative underpinning again, um, and and regulatory and compliance regime for lawyers. Fantastic. And the practice certificates are available from the website of the Bar Association, right? Um, 
no you would not be able to get that you would you would have to get that from the individuals but if you write to the high court registry they would give you a list so every every year you're supposed to apply for and obtain a practicing certificate for that year right. that list is published in the saint lucia gazette um, um and it, it's sort of gazetted so if you go online and search or or, or um check on the government on the government um printry's website you should get a list of the practicing right. um list of, of of practicing lawyers fantastic keith is there anything you want to add to that rather straightforward question i'm not particular i think um jeffrey um said it quite well i think i'll just add that because we have such a robust framework it makes it fairly easy to weed out you know well firstly to understand hey who's an attorney and who isn't i think that's firstly extremely important you can know fairly easily with a google search or an email if someone currently is a registered attorney and if they're in good standing with the bar association and also like jeffrey was saying just the true and tested method doing a bit of research saying lucia as much as we're more or less a small dot on the world scale the information is very accessible and we have very good law firms i would like to believe in saying lucia with high standards and it's fairly easy i would think to quote unquote weed out you know the the um, cream of the crop from the rest so yeah. to speak which is very important particularly for people who've never set foot in St. Lucia and may need a lawyer on island. All right, okay. I, I want to move on to um, still testing the courts and uh, the legal framework in St. Lucia uh, and the rule of law. Uh, one of the things that, you know, sort of periodically comes up through uh, what we often read about in the, in the media is the threat uh, of losing uh, citizenship uh, due to changes uh, in law uh, and other uh, external factors, uh, which has been of a concern. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that clients do ask uh, the question. Um, so under, specifically in St. Lucia, the uh, legal framework um, in St. Lucia, can economic citizens feel confident, um, I, I suppose is the word, uh, that their newly acquired um, citizenship uh, through naturalization uh, is retained for life? So, or is it I something that can be taken away by the state uh, easily? So, Bruno, I think that's a very interesting question. And um, I believe in St. Lucia, there's a very good balance in the sense that it can be taken away, but in very limited circumstances. I think what our legislation aims to do is ensure that one, new citizens, so to speak, feel that the laws and the system is robust enough to protect them from arbitrary revocation of citizenship, but at the same time, to ensure that where bad apples, so to speak, have been allowed to enter the system for one reason or another, that that is dealt with because what you we've seen in our industry is that where you have a bit of injustice, where you have individuals who are unscrupulous or even programs which are unscrupulous, that affects the en entire entity of citizenship by investment in our countries in a very big way. So in St. Lucia, revocation can only happen under limited circumstances. These are firstly that you obtained your citizenship through fraud, through willful misrepresentation of facts, and also through willful concealment of relevant circumstances. The others are if you've been convicted of serious offenses, and also if you perform acts which have the potential to bring St. Lucia into disrepute. Now, whilst that seems quite broad, it is not. So, for the period March 2019 to March 2022, we only had three revocations. And for the period March, sorry, March 2021, for March 2021 to 2022, I believe we've had about two so far. Every revocation is published in the Gazette. So it's known when these things occur. And as attorneys, we follow the Gazette, and there are only two which stick out as of this moment. 
also what is particularly important is whilst your citizenship may be revoked you have a right of appeal against that decision and that right of appeal is to the high court which like we were saying earlier is made up of independent non-political judges and judges who more likely than not are not from St. Lucia or may not be from any CBI offering country and they will apply the law impartially and fairly so citizens can feel comfortable in knowing that look yes there are rules in place like that in every country and that St. Lucia as a jurisdiction we will not we will not allow our program to be used as a means of hiding crimes or as a means of evading prosecution or for other nefarious purposes. But if you are a good person, if you are what the typical investor is, which is an entrepreneur, someone who's looking to retire, someone who's looking for insurance citizenship, second options, if that is your motive, then you have absolutely nothing to worry about. And like I said, we've had potentially five revocations in the last two or three years. You'll see that it's very limited circumstances. And to my knowledge, there's never been an appeal against the decision because our government notes that revoking someone's citizenship is a very serious matter, a matter which can have dire consequences for that person, particularly if they've, they've already revoked their previous citizenship or renounced their previous citizenship, then you leave them stateless. So these decisions are not taken lightly and right. the legislation ensures that there is a path to appeal to ensure that everyone is treated fairly and within the rules of law. All right, let, let me put you um, in, in, in touch with um, a, an example. Um, if I just backtrack a little bit to the Investment Migration Forum in, uh, in Brussels this June, we had a speaker from the um, from uh, DG, one of the DGs in um, at the Commission, a former uh, expert uh, on. Uh, well, he's not a former expert; he's a former uh, employee of uh, one of the DGs in Brussels, um, and he spoke at length about misinformation and disinformation, uh, and how the media is used to disseminate uh, often, you know, sort of you know, discredited or did, it tries to discredit individuals through the media, uh, often through, you know, political attacks, which are, uh, you know, sort of often uh, fake. So it's fake news, right? Uh, so that's disinformation uh, as opposed to misinformation, which is you know, somebody, you know, sort of reporting uh, something which they've misunderstood and completely turning the messaging around. Um, we see that fake news is becoming more of a problem as we spend more and more time on our phones uh, and we tend to or or certainly you know certain generations believe everything that they read kind of thing uh on on the internet how does becoming a saint lucian citizen or protect an individual um from having their citizenship revoked because of you know uh, disinformation uh, that's gone through the media and you know potentially lies that have been told uh, about that individual. How and at what point does the rule of law uh, come in, and how are those decisions made? Maybe Jeffrey. So so there's a lot to chew on there, right? So I think what I'll say, Bruno, is that in our legislative framework, well, the reasons firstly for for revocation are they're very strong reasons and the threshold is quite high. So again, these decisions are made by very qualified and skilled people with a very strong understanding of what the program means to the country and to the individual investor. So, like I said, with only five revocations, we don't allow simply social media or news articles to get to that decision. What is necessary is firstly a conviction, first and foremost, which if you are convicted in the 
competent court, then that in itself, saying Lucia, we would follow that court unless there's reasons to not, in the sense that this is a politically biased court. And also there needs to be sufficient evidence in place. Our government and our minister who's responsible for the program will not on a whim revoke citizenship because that would be truly dire to the country's program. Because the message and the image in which we will give out is, hey, look, someone doesn't like you. They publish an article about you. Hey, you can't be a St. Lucian. And that would be a really ridiculous and dire path to take, to be honest, Bruno. I think that- right. I, I just wonder at this point if our viewers um, could answer this question. In St. Lucia, appeals against the decision to revoke citizenship um, through investments uh, are made by, is it the PM, the Citizenship by Investment Board, or the High Court? I think yeah, eighty percent have answered. So I'm going to close and share those results with you all. Yeah, gents, any comments? Um, well, so so just very briefly, I just wanted to to sort of um follow on from what Keith was saying. The 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 true the true safety net in uh, against threat of sort of flippant revocations is the appeal process through um to the high court again you you're you're now having to take the revocation to the high court and i know i'm i'm helping out with the answer here you take the revocation to the high court for the high court's review of the revocation now when you engage the high court and the court's process what you're doing is bringing it again against the laws of, for example, evidence. So, so to deal with your point more directly, Bruno, when you talk about misinformation and disinformation, well, the quality of the evidence, the quality of the information that you are going to be using to, to, um, to assess whether or not a revocation meets that high threshold that he spoke, spoke about under the legislation will have to be tested at the high court level. So it's not anything that will pick will be picked up on Google can be used to inform a decision for revocation by a high yeah. court judge. It would have to meet th those robust rules of evidence, um, like any other court proceedings. Well, thank you for for clearing that up. Indeed, um, I, I'm conscious of the time, um, and I wonder. Um, what is the investor outlook looking like in uh, in St. Lucia, gents? You want to go ahead, Keith? Yeah, sure. So um, I think right now St. Lucia's, it's an exciting time for our program in that, as most people would know, we've had a bit of a few changes recently, changes in governance, changes in the board of the program. And I think... um naturally change is always good in that you have fresh fresh ideas you have a bit of revitalization so to speak of the unit and of the program itself i think currently the invest outlook is good what's been communicated is that the unit and by extension the government they want to make the program more they, they want to make the program more attractive to investors and how do they do that they want to have more options whether that be real estate whether that be alternative means of investment they also want to ensure that there's good value proposition in the sense that our citizenship is not simply for a passport in the sense that after you become a citizen of saint lucia that there are avenues for you to invest in the island and make a return on your investment whether that be passive investment or whether that be a more direct sort of investment that these options are available to you also they want to ensure that our program remains transparent mm -hmm. that 
And I think that's important. And I think as the industry develops, that's extremely important to investors that they know that their funds and their investment is actually being used to the benefit of the country that they're going to be a citizen of. And yeah. I think that that's a very strong part of our unit's current mandate to ensure that all the funds which are being generated from the program are being used to the betterment of the entire citizenry, being new citizens as well as citizens by both. So I think that it's an exciting time and our program is growing. And I think the end of this year, going forward, we should see continued growth in numbers and in the offerings in place in St. Lucia. All right. And, and gents, um, finally, can you answer my question, uh, which was the subject of uh, um, of this webinar that you you know sort of kindly put together uh, and contributed immensely to? Um, are the Saint Lucian courts and the CBI offering in the Caribbean islands banana republics with kangaroo courts or not? <laughs> Let's put it this way, Bruno. I'm very proud to be a practicing lawyer at the Saint Lucia Bar and before the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal. Um, I've, I've, had, I've had one of my matters um, being heard at the Privy Council, which is our final appellate court, and right. one matter that is progressing there. So I, 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 think, I, I think saying that should spell it out. Um, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm very, very proud of our court. Thank you. Um, I think it's, it's it's a good point because this um, this webinar essentially was driven by um, misinformation and disinformation that you saw published um, on uh, on the internet, uh, which prompted you to write uh, and correct essentially uh, a wrong. If you um, if you are interested, um, Keith. Uh, and Jeffrey have penned a great article, which is published in the uh, IM Yearbook, available from the uh, IMC uh, website. Uh, that's all we've got time for uh, today. I hope uh, you've enjoyed and, and found uh, today's session uh, focused on, on St. Lucia and the, uh, the courts and rule of law uh, in St. Lucia and the Eastern uh, Caribbean states. So feel free to reach out to Jeffrey. Uh, and Keith both um, are active uh, across uh, LinkedIn. Uh, you can also download in the widget on the bottom right hand of your screen uh, information uh, on how to contact them. Uh, I'm sure they'll be pleased to talk to you about uh, the St. Lucia uh, CBI uh, offering. Uh, alternatively, you can also write to me and I'll be happy to uh, make uh, those introductions. Um, until then, though, we are taking a break from crossing borders uh, for the summer. So we hope you uh, all have uh, a pleasant, warm uh, and safe uh, summer. We'll be back on the 14th of uh, September, uh, usual time at 2.30 Central uh, European uh, time. Uh, until then, uh, thank you very much once again to Jeffrey uh, Dubele. Uh, and Keith Isaac uh, from Polaris, uh, based in St. Lucia. Uh, and thank you to the audience uh, for uh, your questions and for joining us uh, today. It's a very good afternoon uh, from me. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Thanks, Bruno. Bye-bye. Introducing the Certification in Investment Migration from the Investment Migration Council, the first structured learning product of its kind globally designed for you. Explore the bite-sized learning pathway of each module on our custom online platform. You can track your progress as you go and learn at a pace that suits you, with an estimated five hours of study time per module. The Certification in Investment Migration contributes to the development of professional competencies and standards for those new to or already working in the industry. So, what are you waiting for? Visit our website to start your learning journey today.